distinguished uh, participants of this uh, marvelous forum. Uh, this is my first time and uh, I already feel at home. Before I approach my topic, uh, spiritual humanism as an emerging or re-emerging uh, global discourse, I would like to make uh, three observations. First, our age, sometimes characterized as the second axial age, requires a holistic humanism or holistic humanistic vision that integrates at least four dimensions of human experience or human existence. The question of the self, of community, of nature, and heaven. The enlightenment mentality of the modern West um, focusing basically on the access of the self and community, community variously understood, often at the expense of nature and heaven. This is too restrictive, too limiting to provide a proper compass for human flourishing. Modernity, rising out of the Enlightenment legacy, is denatured and despirited. For example, even the most sophisticated conception of the Enlightenment project only begins to take religion and ecology seriously. Earlier, there's the idea that human history progressed from religion to metaphysics, then to science. As a result, it suffers from an anthropocentrism that substantially undermines its effectiveness in dealing with uh, ecological and re religious issues. Confucian humanism, this is my understanding of that tradition, on the other hand, seeks harmony with nature and mutuality with heaven. It is neither secular nor anthropocentric. It regards the secular as sacred by infusing spiritual values to earth, body, family, and community. It urges humans to realize and rediscover the ultimate meaning and the deepest source of life in the heaven endowed nature. Our nature is conferred by heaven. The highest human aspiration is then the unity of heaven and humanity. Human beings are not merely creatures, but partners of the cosmic process. Through active participation in the so-called great transformation, we are in one way co-creators and thus responsible for the well-being of not only the human community, but heaven, earth, and the myriad things in between. And this I call it anthropocosmic insight can serve as a corrective to the secular humanism informed by the modernistic mentality. Second observation, the convergence of cultures and religious religions requires a dialogical wisdom that recognizes the interplay between a sense of rootedness and a sense for self-transcendence. The enlightenment demands for certainty are often in conflict with the, with the patience required to deal with uh, the complexities and ambiguities found in the intercivilizational dialogue. The dichotomous mode of thinking by assigning complex phenomena to, nearly, to neatly conceived categories is incompatible with an openness to radically different ways of perceiving the same reality. Tehad Jadan, I quote, talks about center-to-center -center unisons, which suggests that individual elements unite by touching each other at the creative core of their being. 
They release new energy, which leads to more complex units. Indeed, greater complexity leads to greater interi interiority, which in turn leads to more creative unison. Throughout the process, the individual elements do not lose their identity, but rather deepen and fulfill it through unison. The Confucian belief that takes self-cultivation, a form of spiritual discipline, as the root for regulating the family, governance, the state, and peace under heaven, is not based on deductive logic. It is based on the assumption that through dialogue, individuals participating in an ever-expanding network of relationships, not by losing their personal identities, but by developing increasingly more complex consciousness that actually enhances the interiority of each individual. Like digging a well, as we sink into our own concrete existence, ethnicity, culture, language, so forth, we reach the common spring of humanity, allowing genuine communication with others. The Confucian idea of harmony is harmony without uniformity. This aptly captures the fruitful interplay between communion and diversity. This form of humanism, taking the concrete living human being as the focus of its attention, incorporates other units by realizing the self through communion. Self-transcendence paradoxically enhances our sense of rootedness in earth, body, family, and community. Third observation, the modern emphasis on rationality, especially instrumental rationality, is detrimental to communal solidarity. Surely, communicative rationality is a significant improvement in promoting reasonable dialogues. But the convergence of cultures and religions compels us to deal with radical otherness in a comparative civilizational perspective. The certainty in sharing the same linguistic universe in which the rules of the game are, gov are given is no longer there. Yet the courage and wisdom to enter into others' consciousness, allowing ourselves to experience the others' values from their own perspective is enormously enriching. The discovery of values that are rejected, submerged, harmon uh, marginalized, or only enjoyed in our own, in another tradition, maybe radically different, can be truly liberating. It is unlikely that those with a rationalist mindset can really take advantage of such a cross-cultural enterprise. The modern mentality is too individual-centered to appreciate the heuristic value of alternatives to Western modernism. By underscoring the importance of sympathy, empathy, and compassion, Confucian humanism can help to alleviate the difficulties of what we call the dialectic dialogue, focusing argumentation, but a dialogical dialogue, which facilitates human communication. From the perspective of the world of ideas, how we find a path toward peace and cultural understanding through dialogue among civilizations and a sustainable relationship with the earth depends on a new way of thinking, a new cosmology, and indeed a new ethos. Is spiritual humanism a viable option to emerge or re-emerge from the current human condition? In our secular age, presumably as the result of what Max Weber characterizes as the process of rationalization, secular humanism has become the dominant ideology. It is so common and prevalent that it now overshadows virtually all religious and ideological persuasions. For almost a century now, the intellectual ethos in China has been overwhelmed by scientism, materialism, 
and more recently, commercialism, not to mention instrumental rationality. We are desperately in need of formulating effective critiques of the unintended negative consequences of the advent of modernity, such as aggressive anthropocentrism, imperialism, colonialism, the Faustian drive to dominate and possessive individualism. By advocating the unity of heaven and humanity, a sense of reverence towards heaven, respect and care for earth, a fiduciary commitment that is a com community based on trust, a fiduciary commitment to solidarity and peace or under heaven, these are not simply idealistic formulations. Spiritual humanism underscores dialogue, reconciliation, and harmony. The opposite of harmony is uniformity and sameness. But a precondition for harmony is difference, respect for the other. The emergence of an ecumenical and cosmopolitan consciousness is a precondition for us to envision a truly authentic culture of perpetual peace. I assume that all historical religions originated in the Axial Age and indigenous traditions throughout the world, when confronting the dual challenges of ecological degradation on the one hand and dysfunctional global governance on the other, will be encouraged to cultivate, in addition to their particular religious dramas of action, their own dogmas, the language of humanism, as I understand it. We choose to be Christian, Buddhists, Muslims, but inevitably we are human as well. Put differently, we may choose to be human through Christian, Muslim, or Buddhist ways, but we are obligated by the current state of the world to be responsible for the well-being of the human community as a whole. <coughs> The humanism that can guide us to survive and flourish in the 21st century must broaden our intellectual horizon and deepen the moral depth of our current ethos. China's moral crisis is closely related to the lack of faith in something beyond the material world here and now. It is of great urgency that Chinese people, especially the young, cultivate a sense of awe or reverence toward heaven, earth, and the human world in between and beyond wealth and power. Spiritual humanism, a holistic vision for human flourishing, can help religions to become publicly spirited. It is vitally important for Chinese political and intellectual leader to become religiously musical. This would definitely improve Sino-foreign relationships, especially Western Islamic Hindu relationships. It is also crucial for Chinese leaders to cultivate religious sensitivity through mutually beneficial dialogues with Chinese minorities, notably the Tibetans and the non-Chinese speaking Muslims. This, in my view, goes beyond issues of security. It strikes at the heart of a Chinese cultural identity and global perceptions of China as a civilization state. Cultural China, broadly defined, is undergoing a major, even unprecedented spiritual renaissance. This may not appear uh, on the scene at a very superficial level. If we observe mainland China, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, Singapore, and Chinese diaspora communities in Malaysia, in Indonesia, and in North America and all over the world as a symbolic cultural universe. Underlying their economic vibrancy and political dynamism, there is a concerted effort to recover, retrieve, restore, reconfigure, reconstruct, and renew Chinese traditional culture. These dialogical encounters with the past are encouraging. They enable Chinese to discover a rich reservoir of symbolic resources to share with the world. The golden rule stated in the negative is an obvious example. 
Indeed, it is one of the most theoretically sophisticated and practically consequential principles for dialogue among civilizations. Do not do unto others what you would not want others to do unto you. And this is also Jewish. In spiritual humanism, reciprocity and the so-called golden rule stated in the negative must be supported by the positive principle of humanity, comparable to the Christian golden rule in order to establish myself, I help others to establish themselves. In order to enlarge myself, I help others to enlarge themselves. By implication, in international communications, the global public good, such as the environmental protection and establishment of world order, takes precedence over exclusively national interests. I think that the time is ripe that we engage in dialogues on core values, universal values embodied in the enlightenment of the modern West, such as liberty, rationality, legality, human rights, and the dignity of the individual, should be fruitfully compared and substantially enriched by other universal values, sometimes wrongly characterized as so-called Asian values or African values and so forth. These values are all embodied in spiritual humanism, which is a legacy of the world. It's not just restricted to the cynic world, such as justice, rightness, or fairness, sympathy, civility, responsibility, and social solidarity. In China, Given the severity of corruption and untrustworthiness in the public sphere, we learn to appreciate the value, values underlying homo economicus, the economic man. This can be, be defined as the values, as I just noted, such as freedom, rationality, rights, legality, and the dignity of the individual. Obviously, in order for the human community to survive and flourish, these values must be augmented and enriched by other universal values. Let me give you one example. If I insist upon the importance of the human rights, I respect your rights, you respect mine. And yet, I am, I am a billionaire, you are homeless. I have no obligation whatsoever to help you from that human rights discourse. Some other values will have to be entered into the picture, such as justice, equality, fairness. Not just legality, but civility. Not just rights, but responsibility. Not just the dignity of an individual, but also social solidarity. Not just rationality, but sympathy, empathy, and compassion. An important spiritual exercise in the practice of Confucian self-cultivation is to extend our sympathetic feelings so that they encompass an ever-expanding network of human and non-human relatedness. The ideal of spiritual humanism is to form one body with heaven, earth, and a myriad things. From the cultural perspective, I envision the emerging global community to be highly differentiated by primordial ties, highly complex, as a result, plurality and multifacetedness will characterize the cultural scene throughout the world. The future history strongly suggests that the international order will become multipolar. With a view toward the future, as the continuous presence of traditions in modernity, many different traditions, and the modernizing process inevitably assume different cultural forms, concepts such as multiple modernities or even many globalizations will be recognized as uh, insuppressible trends of development. And I want to skip a personal note. My understanding of this problematic is not simply from my continuous working within my own tradition, not just Confucianism, and Taoism and Buddhism, but through my encounter, through my extremely fruitful interactions with uh, theologians in Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, in Islam, in Judaism, and of course in Hinduism, and even in indigenous uh, 
African traditions, such as the tradition of Ubuntu. The great advances in communication and information technologies have expon exponentially broadened and deepened the human capacity to learn, to relearn, and to unlearn. Space and time have collapsed into a new reality of immediate accessibility to data, information, and knowledge about heaven and earth above, earth below, and all things between. The opening lines of the Western inscription, 11th century Chinese thinker, seems uh, realistic rather than simply idealistic in this context. Idea of forming one body with heaven, earth, and a myriad of things. I have a direct quote. Heaven is my father, earth is my mother. Even such a tiny creature as I finds intimacy in their midst. All that fills the universe is my body, and all that directs the universe is my nature. All people are my brothers and sisters, and all things are my companions. This requires that we embrace and respect nature as an integral part of our communion, human communion. In addition to self, community, and nature, there's also a fourth dimension, that is heaven. A defining characteristic of spiritual humanism is the awareness that we ought to show reverence for heaven, for the transcendent. In my interreligious and interspecifizational dialogues for the last four decades, I have come to the realization that Hindus, Buddhists, Jews, Christians, Muslims can take the authentic spiritual humanism, authentic spiritual humanistic stance without in any way losing their primary identities with their own faith communities. There is increasingly a number of believers who are willing and happy to call themselves. I'm not just a Hindu, I'm a humanist Hindu. I'm not just a Buddhist, but a humanist Buddhist, humanist Jew, humanist Christian, humanist Muslim. Provided the presupposition is that the term humanist can be broadened and deepened to embrace true cosmopolitanism that is both naturalistic and spiritual. So the secular humanistic idea, which is different from the spiritual world, from the naturalistic world, has to be totally subverted and rejected. And this broad new humanism itself is naturalistic and spiritual. This uh, humanistic vision presupposes that the meaning of life is realizable and ought to be realized in ordinary human existence. The life world is not merely mundane and profane, but also creative, dynamic, and noble. Heaven engenders and human complete entails partnership. Implicit in this proclamation is the idea that through human effort, heaven's creative vitality will be brought to fruition on earth. Indeed, as participants in the cosmic transformation and co-creators of the evolutionary process, we are capable of and indeed obligated to realize heaven's creativity on earth. But the disorder that we face is that we totally destroy this particular partnership. Each one of us and our community as a whole are so intimately and inseparably connected with all other modalities of being in the cosmos that it's our human responsibility to be cosmologically responsive and responsible. Let me end with four very simple notions. As a comprehensive and integrated humanism, spiritual humanism, four dimensions of the commonly shared human experience, self, community, earth, and heaven are brought together to define the highest manifestation of human flourishing, integrating the body, heart, mind, soul, and the spirit of the self, fruitful interaction of the self and community, home, neighborhood, village, city, province, nation, world, and beyond, sustainable and harmonious relationship between the human species and nature, the animal kingdom, plants, trees, rocks, mountains, rivers, and air, 
and fourth, mutuality between the human heart and mind and the weight of heaven. Thank you. Thank you.